Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're so glad you could be here. I'm your host, Debbie warhurst Cap, along with gardening expert David Yost. How are you? I'm doing terrific. And how about yourself? Good. I'm doing good. Doing good. Um, we've got a great show for you today. Um, when, oh, good. I thought my mic was have, having problems there, but I think we're good. Uh, we're going to be talking about pruning today. Absolutely. This is a great time to be doing your pruning, you know, really in the winter time. We're talking about sort of a January, February, maybe in the March time period. So uh, the lessons you learned today, you can apply them some tier time in the weeks ahead so that the time is right. And also when we get one of those days when it is a little warm and a little sunny, maybe not today, but uh, <laughs> when it, you know, when that sun comes out, it's a great thing to get outdoors and go out there and do. So I, I think pruning, it's, it's, a, it's a fun activity to do out there. You get right. that immediate benefit seeing uh, the, the results of your labors. Um, and this is the time of year to do it. So we're going to go through some pointers on pruning both trees and shrubs. Great. And, it, and it's going to be a little bit warmer weekend than, than some of the weather we've had this, uh, this week. So. Yeah, we just need it to be warm <laughs> and dry. Actually, exactly. tomorrow is looking pretty good. Yeah, great. Okay. And later on the show, we will be taking your phone call. So stay tuned for that. Before we get started, just a couple of quick announcements. We are very excited because next Saturday, January 18th, kicks off our... Winter Spring Seminars are free seminars at all three Maryfield Garden Center locations. And as you can see, we start off with three fantastic topics. Orchids, a gardener's calendar, and terrariums. So we've got quite a, an interesting mix there of, uh, of topics for next week. Uh, lots of great topics throughout the, the whole seminar schedule. And we go pretty much through April. But it changes a little bit for the most part there at 10 a.m. We've got a few afternoon ones, and then as we get into the spring, we'll have some Saturday and Sunday um, um, sections and great ideas. Perennials, roses, water gardening, gardening in small spaces, a lot of landscaping, a lot of different ideas, house plants, even some cooking. Right, and these are popular. They tend to fill in pretty quick, so I try to tell everybody get the, try to get there at least you know five or ten minutes early, so you get a good seat right. uh, because they do fill up quickly. And I wanted to mention a little bit like some of the a lot of the uh, the same presentation I'm doing today on pruning. You'll see some of the same pictures repeated even as we go into the gardener's calendar next week. But it's neat because yeah, we have time to go into more detail, elaborate more. You can come in, your questions and right. answers. So even though it's a little overlap, I still want to encourage you to come to the seminars. Absolutely. We've got great guests. We've got our, our people at Maryfield Garden Center who are so knowledgeable. We've got some outside guests, and you'll see several of those over the next couple of weeks uh, here on the show as well. Right, They're like Jonathan Cavalier is coming in talking mm -hmm. about orchids. He uh, works with Smithsonian Absolutely. now, of course, started with us at That's Maryfield. Right. <laughs> right. So be sure to stop by the stores, pick up a copy of the seminar schedule, or go to maryfieldgardencenter.com. And if you're not on our e email mailing list, please sign up for that, because we send out pretty much weekly, bi-weekly uh, informational uh, yeah, e blasts, so, but we will be sending this out, you know, as well. Uh, as you're there at the store, please take advantage. Our after Christmas sale is is pretty much winding down. I mean, we're starting to pull everything together. They're going to be packing things away. So come on in this weekend and take advantage. It's now 50 to 70 percent off on great Christmas items. So it's a perfect time to stock up for yeah, next we're, year. We're consolidating down and trying to get the garden center set up again. Right. The seeds, all the beautiful, wonderful vegetable and flower seeds are coming out into the place. But uh, so as Debbie said, it's winding down, but there's still some really, really good bargains to be had in there. Still lots of stuff to pick through. So you, you definitely have this little overlap. Got the after Christmas and spring is on the way. Right, right. So um, also pick up your calendar if you haven't gotten one. We're, we're very proud of our free calendars at Maryfield Garden Center. And as always, register for the uh, free tickets that we give, out, give away. 
So lots, lots, lots going on. I was going to mention uh, we were very proud that uh, we had a trade show this week in, uh, in Baltimore. And it's probably one of the main trade shows that, uh, for the nursery industry for the, for the East Coast. And so several of us were up there. Oh, it's huge. I mean, yeah. I was there pretty much the entire day and probably only saw half of it. Right, right. We've got several of our people are up there a couple of days. Um, so as part of that, my dad, Bob Warhurst, was awarded a very special award from the Virginia Nurserymen's Association. Uh, he was awarded, well, I've kind of heard two different uh, uh, titles for it, Distinguished Person of the Year Award or the... Uh, now I can't even remember the, the other one, but he's got a beautiful plaque uh, and a very well-deserved honor. Yeah, yeah. So well, very, like I said, very, very well proud deserved. of my dad. Exactly. He's put his uh, his entire life and his heart and soul into promoting the nursery industry and, and bettering yeah. it. So exactly, and that's from the state association. That's right. So it's that's a little more than just the Fairfax County so area. Way to go, Dad. All right, let's get to our topic. Okay. Well, I'm just going to start right out with some pictures here. Uh, that will emphasize that winter is the season to be doing your pruning. A lot of it, particularly, we're going to focus on deciduous trees and shrubs, the ones that shed their leaves. And a lot of this, because you can go in there, you can really see the branching structure that's in there. You can see uh, if there's branches that are rubbing or crossing, or if the shape's uneven. Uh, the other is that it's in its dormancy, you know, so there's no sap flowing, you're not disrupting the growth process of the, the tree or shrub. And of course, another advantage is we don't really have any kind of insect or disease activity going in. So the winter time, uh, this sort of January, February, uh, March time period is really ideal for pruning many of your trees and shrubs. Now, just as an example of pruning, I've uh, selected the crepe myrtle. There's a lot of different methods and techniques. Uh, it's one of these things where there's no one right answer or wrong answer in there. Crepe myrtle, which is such a popular landscape plant for us, uh, this is a shows you the winter view, and then it shows you obviously in summertime when it's flowering. This is uh, what I call a selective thinning or natural target pruning. Uh, these plants have been pruned, but we've retained their natural form, their natural shape to it, the natural structure to the plant. Uh, but they did go in and thin out some of these branches to open up the canopy, get better air and sun penetration into there, better flowering and nicer form uh, and shape to the plant. Now this exact same plant of uh, here, it was pruned much more aggressively. You can almost see what I call those knobby knees in there. They went through and they did this heavy rejuvenation pruning. Uh, they cut them all back to a height of about 18, 24 inches, and then they sprouted out again from that base. And then you can see the, um, the small inset where it shows them flowering the next summer. So it's the same tree, but two different pruning techniques, but with two different objectives in mind on there. So again, exactly how we prune this is where we talk about being both an art and a science. Uh, you can influence how that plant's gonna perform in the landscape, the appearance that it's going to look. Uh, and I look at it as kind of partnership between us, the gardener, and the plant itself. So I'm gonna go through several examples today of just different techniques, uh, how you do it, discuss the timing, and which way you choose to approach it really is a choice. It's just that, it's not right or wrong. That's right, that's great. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break and come back with some great ideas for you to keep your garden looking great. Hi everybody, welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. So glad you could join us today. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. We're talking about successful pruning. And David has brought in lots of pictures and uh, he's got some tools to show you later. So David, is you over, over in our virtual garden. Are you ready for us? Okay. There we well, go. Let's talk about pruning. This is, um, I know it's, you know, I love talking about it and I know we'll get lots of questions from you about this later today. Uh, here I am obviously standing between two different trees. This is a uh, local shopping mall and I thought it was a good example because on, along the same road uh, the management company on one side you know, left the trees alone and the other side went through and pruned them. So one of the things I want to talk about is first of all we really have to set a clear objective. What is our purpose? What is our intent? Before you even make your first cut, you need to have some idea of where you're going and why you're pruning. 
So what would happen is uh, if I look at the, this tree, this tree was untouched. Now it would benefit from some pruning. You can see we have some of these branches we call sort of forming a co-dominant leader. You know, this side of the tree really is getting a little bit out of balance, a little bit lopsided. I would have suggested or it would be nice to come back in there and we call subordinate that, lower that a little bit. Uh, we've got some branches that are crossing through here that you might want to thin out. But this is the tree in this completely natural, untouched state. Uh, if we look on the other side, uh, this tree was pruned, but in this case, we, they uh, chose to go in and sort of what I call give it a haircut. They went through and just cut the top of this canopy off. And what ends up happening when you do this, of course, you're cutting all the growing points, the growing tips off of it. The tree responds with you get this proliferation of branching and growing through the top of the canopy. This is an example where through incorrect pruning, we've actually made, we've structurally compromised the tree, we've weakened it. So what I'm saying is my first rule of pruning is do no harm. This is a case where doing nothing uh, was better than going in there and doing something. So there's really never a point in time where I'm gonna see you go in there and prune uh, a mature shade tree in that fashion. What we're gonna see is next picture, this tree after it started to leaf out. So the next summer, from an aesthetic perspective, it kind of has this ball sort of pom-pom look. So it's not, for me personally, not doing much aesthetically. Uh, at the same time, structurally, we have all this little fine tip, all that little branching out top. Uh, that is structurally weakened. Those branches are actually more prone to breakage and more prone to damage. So I can understand the idea here. The objective was these trees were getting too big, they were obstructing the view, and they wanted to reduce the size of the tree. Now let me show you another tree, same situation, but took a different approach. Now this is a Japanese maple, again in the winter time. This is a beautiful specimen tree. Uh, has those nice deep uh, burgundy red leaves around it. But this is a, um, it's a small growing species, but over time it started to outgrow its space. You can see that canopy is blocking the sunlight from getting to the window. It's obstructing a little bit the entrance into the house. Uh, so here our goal is the same. I want to reduce the size of this canopy uh, but I'm going to do it where we retain the natural shape and form of the tree. So this is my before picture. Then we're gonna look at our after picture coming up here. But in this case, uh, we went in and I went in there and sort of did reduce the canopy. I thinned out the branches, but as you can see, um, we've retained the natural shape of it. So this tree, the overall canopy was reduced by about 20% or so, and then if we, Fast forward to our next picture, this is how it looks in the summertime when it's branched out. So we've maintained the openness, we've maintained the natural form of it, uh, the natural structure of the tree, uh, but we have reduced the size. Now a tree like this, you may need to come back again the following year if you wanted to reduce that canopy again, I would come back and take that back just a little further. So when they do get out of control or size, it's best if we do this over a two, three year period. I don't really generally like to take more than 20, 25% of the growth out at any one time of year. So this is why I'm calling a natural target pruning. Our branches, our cuts are made where that branching naturally occurs rather than just sort of randomly topping it off. So I go into what I sort of call sort of a three-step process where first, if there are branches that are dead or branches that are rubbing and crossing, I'll take those out, kind of get a nice structure to it. And then my third and final phase is why I go in and sort of shape it up. But looks like, let's take a look at a couple other examples because uh, I think this is really the best way to do it. Now for pruning evergreens, um, evergreens is a little bit different. I prefer to prune those a little bit later in the season, very late winter, early spring. So now this might be something that we're hitting in uh, March, even the very first part of April time period. And with evergreens, particularly needled evergreens, things like spruce, pine, firs, uh, they don't have those buds on the interior growth. All their growth occurs out the tips of it. So we have to be a little more stingy in how we manage this. They don't respond real well to heavy pruning. 
But in this case, uh, this is a situation where this is a weeping Norway spruce that was grafted onto a blue spruce and planted as a specimen uh, in this area. But over the years, it really outgrew the space. And I was asked, you know, what to do with it? Well, in the big scheme of things, I could say, hey, this tree was not the proper selection for that area. Uh, it's too big of a species and too small of a confined space. But it's so highly valued to us, we decided we were going to work with what we had. I'm going to go in, I'm going to do a pretty drastic, like 50% reduction pruning on this, uh, just in an effort to salvage the plant. So again, we're looking at here, kind of a before and after. You can see how big that weeping spruce was in the before picture. Uh, we went in and we did cut it back drastically, but you know what? I think we were pretty successful in salvaging the um, overall shape and form of it. And then I've got one more picture that shows us uh, about three years later, this same tree, if we want to fast forward to that next picture. So again, we um, three years later, I went back in and I did some pruning uh, and we were able to extend the life or extend the value of this tree in the landscape. You know what, I've got pictures of some other shrubs and things. I wanna talk about pruning shrubs. I'm gonna talk about doing some weeping plants, but we're at a good time to take a little commercial break right now. So let's just uh, stick with me. When we come back, we're gonna take this same idea and progress into some other trees and shrubs in your garden. Welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. We're talking about pruning. I'm just going through a bunch of examples. And, and I tell you, it's something that takes time to learn. I encourage you, we're gonna be having classes on this at our seminars uh, where you can go into a lot more detail. But uh, we talked a little bit about pruning deciduous trees, some evergreens. I wanted to say a thing or two about pr pruning of deciduous shrubs. Now, the, what I'm promoting is this idea, what I call this selective thinning. Uh, in this diagram, you can see I've got my sort of my before image here, and there's all these stems in there. This plant is very thick. It, the growth is very tight and dense on it. Uh, what will happen, these branches rub and cross, the trees can, or the shrubs competing with itself. It's not getting as much sunlight in there, and sometimes the flowering diminishes. Or a lot of times, our main reason people are out there pruning really a lot of times is trying to reduce the overall size of it. So again, proper plant selection is a big, big thing as far as um, trying to limit the amount of pruning you have. Trying to select plants will stay in the area that they have. But they get big, they get overgrown, we go in, we want to rejuvenate them. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is maybe go in and cut out about a third of the growth. Uh, and the idea is going in where we take maybe a third this year, a third next year, a third the following year. So this is something we do on a regular ongoing kind of maintenance perspective. And again, I'm gonna use a smoke tree here as an example. So we'll start with my before pictures. Uh, the smoke tree is a big sprawling shrub. Uh, it can grow, you know, it could be trained into a small tree or a large shrub, almost similar to like we were talking about with crepe myrtles. Now this is a very old specimen. Uh, it's been neglected for many years, but when I look in there, what's happened, if you kind of see this branch where it's crossing and rubbing uh, right in there. So what I want to do is I want to maintain the structure of this plant but I want to eliminate where these branches are rubbing against each other, causing wounds. I want to open it up so that that growth is directed outward rather than inward. Uh, and this is the plant that we started with. So we'll go forward, sort of that's my before. The next picture shows our during. Uh, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm going in there and trying to eliminate some of these competing branches that are causing that rubbing and crisscrossing in there. I'm trying to open it up, um, you know, removing any dead, dead branches, get some structure to it, and we progress from this to the finished product. Uh, and now what will happen on this, uh, see I've, I've gotten all that, I've got some nice structure in there, we opened it up, really highlighted the form of the plant. I did go in, and it's a little difficult to see, but up here in the canopy you can see where I've made some cuts to reduce the size of it. 
Uh, now what happens on this plant, the flowers really are of secondary interest, but they still add interest to the plant. Uh, but the flowers are already set in there. So when you're doing your pruning on flowering shrubs like this, you are removing flower buds, but to me that's of secondary importance. So this is the plant, and then what happens, I took pictures of it the next summer uh, as it came out, so I like to show how the finished product comes out. Take a look at that. And here we go. These little poofs that, uh, that you see in there, those are the flowers. So what we've done, we've kind of hit a compromise. I left enough flower buds in there to give us a little bit of a display. Uh, but it's reinvigorated the plant. You got all this nice uh, foliage growth in there, which is its primary interest. And we're well on our way to really getting this plant in good, vigorous shape. And again, we'll maintain it um, better condition from this point on. Let's, can't even remember what I have as my next example. Let's see, what's next? Weeping trees. I get lots of questions about weeping Japanese maples. In this case, here I've got a weeping red bud. It's a nice specimen tree. Uh, again, this is a perfect tree, good plant selection, the right location. It's the right size. It's just, it's been there for a few years and I want to go in and do a little, uh, little bit of thinning and opening it up. This is more that artistic side where I like to see this structure. I really like on these maples and uh, weeping red buds. I like to see that cascading structure that's in there. And there's so much growth in here. It's so tangled up and dense that I think it's detracting from that. So again, what I'll do is the first thing is I go in, I have, I'll remove any dead branches that are in there. Then I start to remove rubbing and crossing branches. And then we start pruning for aesthetics. Now in this case, this one of our um, designers, and maybe you know Amy Strunk, she's been on the program with us. Uh, Amy and I are, uh, this is her tree, we're looking at, we're evaluating it. And again, before we make any cuts, before we do anything, we're gonna kind of set our goals and objectives and discuss where we're headed. You need to have a plan before you get started. So we're looking here, identifying what needs to come out, and then we go to work. So like I said, the first step we're gonna do, if uh, we just progress through these pictures, the first thing we're gonna do is that's a dead branch. Uh, we're moving the dead branches, but we are making sure that where we cut them, we don't injure the branch collar. If you look right underneath this cut, this little um, stub looking thing, this is what we call the branch collar. That needs to remain intact because that's where it's gonna naturally seal and cover over those wounds. So we go in, cut the dead branches out, continue. Then we start to go in and do what I call kind of our structural pruning. If we can take our next look, uh, where we remove rubbing branches. This is a very close-up picture. Uh, you can see right in this zone here, the branch was running between those. It was becoming embedded. It was rubbing between those two larger branches. That actually creates a wound that can then allow wood decay organisms to get in there. So we removed the dead branches. Uh, we took the rubbing and crossing branches out of there. And then we go out and start working at the outermost canopy. This is where we kind of start to bring it back in and reduce the size of it. While here, we're also working to maintain that nice cascading form of it. And it's fun, this is great. Um, the nice thing, plants, they're resilient. Hey, if something goes wrong, you make a bad cut, guess what, it'll grow back, you know? So, um, so don't be too afraid to go in there and cut. Uh, and then we're proceeding through there. Uh, this is where Amy's trying to show you where we've opened up the branching in there. We're starting to get some real structure to it. We had some conversation about this branch right here because it is crossing back over the center of the tree, but that's also one of the things that's adding interest to it. So that's that just judgment side where we chose to leave it in there. So we did our thinning and then let's see where it progresses from here. This is the finished product uh, looking good. And again, my final picture is gonna show where it's flowering in the next spring. So again, beautiful specimen tree. We've maintained the shape. We've enhanced the form and integrity. We brought it back in a little bit. If you can remember back to that earlier slides, there's no chopping and you know just random cutting in here. This is really uh, the way I'd love to see you do it. Okay, so once again, I'm being told we have to take a little commercial break. Uh, when we come back, I've got some more examples of shrubs and how we can prune them and keep them looking beautiful in your landscape.
David, those are some great examples of how to prune. Now, you were at Amy's, and you also did some work in our backyard. Yes, and we'll just continue through this, because I think mm -hmm. really the best way to teach this is just by showing Show as many mm -hmm. examples as, uh, as time permits. Right. Uh, so you're right, this is now we moved to Amy's backyard mm -hmm. uh, for our next example. And we're moving in a little bit of uh, flowering shrubs. So we're going to start by looking at a limelight hydrangea. Uh, now this is a summer flowering shrub, very much like the crepe myrtle. They can be treated the same way. They're both examples of trees or shrubs that flower on new growth. So what that means is during the dormant season, the winter time like it is now, uh, there are no flower buds on there, so you can cut it back as severely or as aggressively as you choose to. It's going to push out new growth uh, and then flower again for us in the summertime. So it's the same routine. Now this is a large shrub, but it's being trained in her case because it's a townhouse backyard. Right. We're using it as a small tree. Mm -hmm. so, so we actually are pruning it and trying to maintain it into a tree form. So we go in there and, and that, that didn't need a whole lot of work, but we wanted to sort of open up the canopy, remove that branch that was sort of shooting through the center um, and get that tree form back into it. Right. And then our next goal is it was getting too big for the place, so we go up into the canopy right. and start reducing the size uh, that we can see in our next picture here. Uh, now, whenever we're making our cuts, uh, when I'm removing branches, like I said, I want to protect that branch collar. When I'm cutting on branches just to reduce the size, we're cutting just above the bud that's there. So you can see in that close-up, uh, those buds are where it's going to branch out uh, next spring as we go into the growing season. So we want to cut as close to that but without actually injuring the bud. And this is the finished um, product. You know, I know it looks substantially sparse, but this is an aggressive grower, just like the crepe myrtles, and it will bounce back and bloom for us next summer. To give you an idea of how aggressive it is, I took a picture of our debris pile. That's for sure. Because uh, I still remember when we were out that, there with Amy, she was gasping she was a, little, a little bit. She was a little nervous about that. Yeah. <laughs> so that is quite a pile left. And unfortunately, I wish I had a I picture of it in bloom. We've got to um, go back out and get a picture. We do. She yeah. said it. She did confirm it came back beautifully, yep. bloomed prolifically. It was a success. <laughs> but I show that to give you some idea of, um, you know, not to be afraid. Right. To go in there and get aggressive. Now, I put viburnum in here as an example of a spring flowering shrub that carries its blossoms on what we call old growth. So, mm -hmm. what this translates into, like if you have viburnum in your landscape, Today, it already has the flower buds on there. So I'm saying that winter is the time of year to go out and prune it, but as you're pruning, mm -hmm. you are cutting flower buds right. off. So this is where you kind of find this happy medium where I'm saying I take about 25% of the growth out. I like to just selectively thin it because right. I, want to re I want enough buds left behind to give you a good floral display like you just saw. Now the next picture I show is where somebody went out and sheared the plant. They went back and they, rather than selective thinning, again they took shears to it, you know. Ouch. Cut it back. <laughs> hey, it's a nice, tight, dense growth. It's got good shape, but at the expense of all your flower right. buds and blooms. So I am recommending that we go in and we do the hand pruning to, th you know, to thin them out, but we still want to leave enough buds behind. Well, I think the main thing with pruning is to, to know what your purpose is for what you're pruning for that particular plant. Instead of just saying, hey, it's time to prune, know what you're, like whether you want to keep it a tree form, whether you want to select it thin, what exactly you want to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and as you were looking at these pictures, it really doesn't take a lot of tools to do this. Right. They're just a couple basic things that I want to show as mm -hmm. far as getting the work done that's there. Uh, one I thought is, you know, of course everybody needs a good pair of gloves and I thought, I know Peggy's in here. I was going to say, where's your fox gloves? Well, because I, I was think Peggy's in here talking about <laughs> fox gloves mm -hmm. all the time and they are terrific, but we have our favorites. That's right. Those are kind of for the ladies. <laughs> um, I'm going to show, I'm the other extreme. These are my favorite gloves, <laughs> these nitrile tough gloves. You know, I've been, um, I've been using these for years and part of this because I'm such a cheapskate, you know, these are really <laughs> inexpensive what I call almost throwaway gloves, but you can toss them in the washer. Um, oh, that's great. Usually at the end of one or two years, they really are spent and everything, mm -hmm. but they've got sort of the, um, the nitrile palms on there, you know, so that they uh, are weather resistant. 
fabric on the back side of it so that your hand breathes. And they're not so thick where you, can, you, you can't feel what you're doing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's why. So that's why I like they're tough, they're durable, they're inexpensive, right. um, and they've served <clears throat> me well over the years. Now to do this selective thinning we were talking about, you'll notice there were two tools that I was using in there a lot. Um, a good pair of hand pruners. Uh, this is where Peggy and I do agree. Right. We both love the Felco pruners. <laughs> now this one um, will cut up to a one inch diameter branch that's in there. And so when we do anything that starts to exceed that one inch diameter, we go to using a pruning saw. Uh, and I can hold that. Right. Mm -hmm. Basically there's a pruning saw <laughs> is different from a carpenter saw. Uh, the teeth on this are, they're very wide teeth, they're very open, they're designed for cutting through green wood, and they're actually reversed. So it, this saw cuts as you're pulling it back as to pushing it forward. So a nice pruning saw, you know, cuts anything that's larger than that one inch cut. Uh, and whether you get one like this, which has the fixed blade, or the one that personally I use as a folding saw, you know, I like because you just kind of bring it out of the pocket like that. Mm -hmm with a folding blade here. I'm getting myself all confused. <laughs> There's uh, an arsenal of tools yeah. here. But basically, you're going to, a hand pruner, a nice pruning saw mm -hmm. are really the only things you need. If you want to go just one step further, and I call this a supplement, just to make life easier, that's where a good pair of loppers oh, yeah. uh, that's in there. And these basically is like long-handled pruners. It just makes it easier so you don't got to bend and stoop, right. you know, as we get a little older and our backs don't, exactly. aren't quite as resilient. Uh, this is sort of a nice bonus to have. Well, and there's so many different sizes to choose from on, on all these, and especially these Felco pruners. You've got left-handed varieties, right-handed varieties, different sizes, you know. So yeah, it's it's, great. I always tell people it's like buying a pair of shoes. You gotta come in, get them fit for style mm -hmm. and comfort. That's right. There you go. So you want to be able to do your job well. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna take your phone calls. So if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046, and we'll talk to you in just a couple of minutes. We're, we've got seminars. Now, next week in the gardener's calendar, you're going to touch on pruning a little bit. Right, but as I said, that's one section of the entire talk. Right repeating some of the things you saw today. Right. And then on March 1st, Larry Shapiro is going to be devoting the whole seminar to pruning. Yes. So, lots of opportunities yeah, to learn about it. He actually gets a little hands-on. Takes you out in the garden. Right. Lots of fun. Okay. We're taking your phone calls, so if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046. And David, our first caller, is a pruning question. Gretchen's calling from Forestville. Hi, Gretchen. Are you there, Gretchen? Oh. How are you? Oh, there okay, we go. There we are go. you there? Yes, I'm here. Good Can you morning. hear me? Yes, yes we, can. we can. How are you? Okay, good morning. Happy New Year. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Well, I have a question to go on a crepe myrtle. Okay. I purchased this crepe myrtle about uh, maybe 10 years ago from a stick plant area. It was like a dollar. And I wasn't going to let it die, and it did not. So it has been growing and growing about now 10 feet tall. Now, right. I want to prune it because I don't want it as tall as it is. Uh, can I do a third of the pruning, perhaps, and topping it without damaging it? Yes, crepe myrtle is um, it's a wonderful plant for many reasons, but of course one of these is it's so, it responds so well to pruning. Uh, you can do almost anything with that plant. You can train it into a tree form, you can keep it in a shrub form, you know, you can kind of have that multi-stemmed look to it. Oh, okay. um, it's a really versatile plant. And it is one that, um, because it's such an aggressive grower, even if you get more aggressive on the pruning, let's say you cut it down as much as like 50%, um, mm -hmm. it will respond, it will grow back, and it will bloom for you. So really, it's back to what I was saying, look at it kind of in your mind, visualize how you want it to look this summer, uh, what you want the mature size to be, and then it's, there's really no rules. Just do your pruning while it's dormant here. Uh, so you figure what that plant's going to put on maybe, you know, two feet of growth a year if you're really lucky at one to two feet. So depending on what you want the mature size, right. uh, just go back there and make your cuts and make it the shape that you want it to be. Okay, I've taken cuttings from that, you know, uh, over the years and, and, and transplanted them and they're growing. Is there a time frame in which I should cut the seedling from that where I've transplanted elsewhere? 
Uh, again, sometime during its dormant season, you know, which okay. means, you know, now sort of January, February, you know, March time period. Crepe myrtles really don't start leafing out and growing till May, so you can even push that right. to as late as April, I would say. Uh, but you're just looking for a time when the weather's nice uh, okay. and you feel like getting out there in the yard okay. and doing a little bit of work. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. That's one of the easiest plants in the world to work really. with. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Okay, Karen is calling from Bowie. Are you there, Karen? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How can we help you? I have a uh, flower bed that's up against my house that is just been had been overgrown for years. And a friend of mine and I went in and we took a bunch of stuff out. And lo and behold, there was this tiny little Nandina back there that I didn't know existed. And now that all the big stuff has been removed, it's growing. And I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to prune it or shape it or anything. Yeah, things, plants like Nandina and crepe myrtle we've talked about a lot of times, they will self-seed uh, just from the, from the seed pods on the plant. So that's my guess is you just had a volunteer come up from a, a neighbor's plant or surrounding plant. So those are always just, you know, free plants and a treasure to find out there. Now Nandina, it tends to be what we call heavenly bamboo is the common name because it has these multiple stems that come up uh, from it, several stems. And what will happen is over time, it can get what we call leggy where, you know, all the growth is at the top and it's kind of naked down below. Yeah. So the, the recommended way to prune this is when it starts to get to that point, through selective thinning, you go down there, you go right down close to the ground level and cut out some of the oldest branches. I know this is kind of gutsy, it's hard to do because now I'm going in and, and I'm cutting the oldest, most vigorous growth out of it, but that promotes and encourages new growth to come up from the bottom or from below in there. So the plant doesn't necessarily require pruning, but when it gets mature, when it gets to a point where it's starting to get that leggy growth and it's not looking lush and full, you go in and take out maybe 25% of the older growth um, and you do that kind of on an ongoing maintenance basis rather than going in and doing it all at once. Maintenance basis meaning year to year or maintenance basis meaning throughout the throughout the year? Meaning like each year, um, okay. usually in late winter, and I'm talking more towards uh, March time period, I'll go in and each year take out one or two of the oldest stems. Now that's after it's had a chance to mature a little bit. Uh, but I just prune it that one time, not, not throughout the year, just that one right. time right. in okay. late winter or early spring. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for the call. Thank you. Take care. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is um, Jim, who's calling from Alexandria. Hi, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I have a um, bed in front of my house that I uh, of evergreens and trees that uh, used to separate or enhance the separation from the roadway. And I've got autolucan laurels, crepe myrtles, and tulip poplars all kind of staged up in, in fairly close proximity. Are there any tips or question a comment you might make on the that unique aspect of a layered um, evergreen and mixed tree mixed deciduous trees well the the good news is those are all plants that do respond well to pruning uh, and you've got a lot of latitude to work with on there now we didn't talk too much about broadleaf evergreens like the laurels I talked a little bit about needled evergreens and this is a, a fine distinction the conifers, like I said, juniper, spruce, pines, you know, the cami cypress, those you have to be stingy with the pruning on it because they, they are not able to regenerate growth. But if you get into broadleaf evergreens like your laurels, you know, even azaleas and hollies and so on, they do have dormant buds all inside there and respond well to it. So laurels, if they're getting overgrown, uh, you can go in there, you can prune them aggressively, however much you need to prune them, um, and they will leaf back out and fill back in. Uh, so if they're getting out of control, uh, you can do that. Again, I'm gonna say kind of uh, late February, March time period, so they start regrowing in April. When you talked about the magnolia, the uh, tulip magnolia. Tulip poplar. Or, or tulip poplar. Uh, so those are the big trees, right? We're talking about the same tree? Correct. Yeah. Uh, 
they they generally don't require much pruning of other than if they're really getting too big or if they've got some damage in there uh, so again if you feel a need to prune that then uh, we would do that during the winter time uh, when it's in there and I've forgotten what was the third plant you're using? The crepe myrtles as an intermediate uh, plant yeah. so I've got uh, laurels at uh, you know four feet or so and I've got the tulip poplars that are up run 12 to 20 right. feet and then in between I've got uh, the crepe myrtles and right. typically I've been leaving letting them grow out about six inches a year on the stem but starting to thin them down now. Yeah. Now that that's a fantastic combination as a sound barrier. You'd mentioned around the highway because you do have the varying heights there and there. You've got a mix of deciduous and evergreen. Uh, if you have the room, that is the way to create a barrier between you and the highway. My only little concern is that for the crepe myrtles, eventually if they start getting shaded out, um, that's going to diminish their flowering. So you may find if the if you run into that where the crepe myrtles, if their flowering is getting diminished, you may have to do some thinning in the taller canopy of the poplars to keep some sunlight getting into them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the call. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of your phone calls. Okay, let's get right back to our callers. Our next caller is Margaret who's calling from Kensington, Maryland. Hi, Margaret. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Uh, good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine. We uh, planted some little four-foot Lelands to, uh, as a privacy screen, mm -hmm. and we did not realize that the deer um, will, would strip the bark off the Lelands, and one of them, like the first foot or so, they stripped the bark off of the, the central branches, and of right. course they, they have died, and we want to know what we should do to try to salvage this little tree and when we should prune it. Well, well, Leyland cypress don't respond real well to pruning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I don't know exactly based on its condition how you're going to salvage it. When I said um, with Leyland cypress, you can prune them, but you have to stay out where it's soft and green and it's supple. You know, if the deer damage, if they kill it all the way back to the interior where it's just um, woody growth, then it's not capable of regenerating or filling back in or if it does, it's a slow process. So normally with Leyland Cypress, we just, if we prune them, we do just a little bit of light shearing out at the tips, and that's done, you know, again, maybe in, in that March time period. Uh, so if you've got branches that they really broke or cracked or something like, they may just have to be removed. If the damage is severe, the plants may have to be replaced. And the deer, they do that during their uh, rutting season. Usually we run into that mostly in, it could be late September, but it's like October, November time period. And if that's going to be a problem for you, you may have to put some type of barrier around those, at least while they're young. Uh, we've used anything from tomato cages to wire fencing, or at the very least putting some deer repellents on there. Yeah, we did, we did put up a fence, but like the whole top of the, the, whole top of the tree is dead. Yeah, then um, you, you may be, unfortunately, looking at replacement. You can give it some time to see how the tree responds. But that's the thing that I have to say with conifers. Once those growing points, if they're killed, uh, they're not going to grow back the way that, say, a holly or a magnolia or other evergreen trees may. But can we cut that top off in March? Oh, you can cut the top off. That may be what you have to do, and it's just the tree is going to be disfigured. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but it's just something that happened. Okay, thank you. Okay, good luck with good it. Good luck. Okay. Well, let's see. Our Irene is calling from Reston. She's our next caller. Hi, Irene. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm calling about a brown turkey fig tree. Mm -hmm. It's two years old now, and we bought it at about five feet. But it seems like it's growing out of control. And uh, last year we pruned it a little bit. And I'm wondering about pruning it again this winter, because if it gets to be 12 feet high, it's hard to pick the fruit, and it's going to be way out of proportion for what we want in our garden. Right. So what would you suggest about pruning? How far back? Yeah, I would, I would prune it um, while it's dormant, you know, meaning before yeah. the growth season begins. Now with figs, because they can be a little temperamental in their cold hardiness, and we've certainly had the cold temperatures, you might wait until very late winter, early spring, when you start to see a little bit of buds uh, breaking out on there. So we're talking again that March uh, time period and prune it back at that time. 
Now figs, they're, they're interesting in that you already have the um, flower buds on there. So when you prune this back, you are going to remove what we call the first fruit on there. Uh, do you, let me ask Irene, do you usually get two harvests out of these figs? Well, we get one very long harvest. Okay. This may influence the harvest on there because we call that first um, harvest or first fruit. You'll be cutting that off when you prune it, but this is a vigorous plant. It's going to regrow. It will set buds and then you'll get, you'll still capture that second harvest that's in there. So I would go ahead and I would cut it back. I'd cut it back to whatever size you need it to be. So that might even be a vigorous cut. But rather than getting that one long harvest, mm -hmm. your early fruit won't be there, but you should still get your late season harvest out of it. Good. Sounds good. Yeah. And by the way, this program is excellent. I've oh. enjoyed every bit of all these trees and shrubs that you've talked about. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Like I said, pruning is a lot of fun. We always get lots of questions about it. Okay. Well, take thank care. you so much. Okay. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see. Michael is calling from Temple Hills. You there, Michael? Yes, good have, morning. How you doing this good morning? Good morning. We have great. less than a minute. Do you have a very quick question? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about rose bushes. Um, what is the best way to what is the best way to prune a rose bush and keep its aesthetics? Because a rose bush can get kind of clumpy and right. and, uh, and and grow a lot in the middle of it. I'm gonna have to okay. give you a quick, give you a quick answer, answer, answer here, Michael. And we'll we'll talk about this more when we talk about roses. But basically, roses, yes, you want to do a heavy rejuvenation pruning. That's gonna be some time in March. So you cut it down to a height of about 12 inches. You want to direct the growth outwards uh, as you can. And then as it's flowering, you may need to remove the spent flowers or what we call deadheading to keep it continue flowering. But eventually when we talk about roses, we'll go into more detail. Absolutely, thank you, Michael. Sorry to, to have you be so short. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for this great topic, wonderful information. Next week, we talked about being at Amy's house. Amy Strunk's gonna be with us.